Uh, James Sloan is a, uh, a space systems analyst for Information Universe, and he's going to be talking on the, the he's going to have a talk entitled Market Study of Commercial Space Settlements in Low Earth Orbit. Uh, this paper uh, basically uh, got started with the idea that uh, towns locate where there are income sources. And presumably space elements will also locate where there are income sources. For those of you who are interested in space business, I highly recommend that you read the Commercial Space Transportation Study that was produced by NASA. Uh, there are some problems in that study. Among them is that NASA didn't really explain the difference between price and cost. In the study, they, what they found was that uh, the communication satellite industry is not uh, responsive to a lowering of launch costs. But what they fail to explain, though, is what happens when a private company does reduce its launch cost. What the private company would do is simply lower its price enough to knock out the competition and uh, then presumably raise its price back up to the standard uh, launch cost while keeping its launch, I'm sorry, launch price while keeping its launch cost low and thereby making a profit. So typically the uh, profit on a launch vehicle is about 10%. So for every $5,000 that the uh, launch company collects, it actually has $500 million to put into its own coffers for reinvestment. A company that lowers its costs to $1,000 will be making, with this market, roughly uh, $2.4 billion a year. Now, in the area of material processing, this was, again, a market area which is not responsive to lowering of launch costs. Uh, the products that are typically found are on the order of a value of $100,000 per pound. And the, the barriers to this industry is basically having ready access to space. Uh, the problem with the, going through NASA's bureaucracy is to uh, having to uh, write up a proposal of how they're going to do their research in space on a space, sta on a space station, and simply how do they get their equipment on board the space shuttle. So here again, uh, we have a fairly large profit margin, but uh, it isn't affected really by launch costs at all. If we look at uh, what the federal government would pay for a lunar base, the simple fact is they won't pay very much. The, uh, the, if they would, there is no possibility that we will see another Apollo program. So what the uh, best estimate I think would say is that they would probably increase over inflation uh, NASA's budget by 10% or about $1.3 billion to support a lunar base. That would allow figuring that they do it over, say, one political term of office for the president, that's four years. So you're looking at maybe $5 billion for an R&D project. Now, since the uh, lunar base would be an ongoing project, they'd be spending $1.3 billion a year for the uh, private company to make a profit margin off of this they really have to drop below $1,000 a pound because NASA and the federal government really wouldn't even consider a lunar base unless they were getting a much greater value than they could today. Now, at $5,000 per pound, NASA could today support a four-man base on the moon, and they just won't go for that. A 20-man base, they would go for So if you drop the price to $1,000, put a 20-man base on the moon, yeah, the federal government would probably go for that. But now, private industry has to drop the launch cost to $500 a pound. Now, in space tourism, we face an even bigger problem. The uh, study 
did go into space tourism, and they did it very well. The figures ran um, at, for a $10,000 tour package at about 200,000 passengers per year. And they, that varied from anywhere from 20,000 passengers to 2 million. That's basically the level of uncertainty. Now to uh, basically make a billion dollar profit off of this market, which is $2 billion. Launch costs have to drop to about $25 per pound. So now the question is, how do we get, uh, go from $5,000 a pound to $25 a pound? And my focus was uh, basically, I was looking at orbital transfer vehicles, and uh, I became interested in the idea, the concept of moving mass into orbit and assembling that mass on orbit, basically using smaller launch vehicles. What I found was that we have to, in order to reduce operating costs of a launch vehicle, you have to increase the flight rate. What we should be doing is flying essentially every day. Now, there's also a limit here with orbital dynamics. From the continental United States, a single launch site and a single space station, you have only one flight opportunity a day. Now, the equator, the uh, space station would overfly based on the period of the orbit. So, with a 90 minute orbit, you'd have 18 opportunities per day. On a two hour orbit, it'd be 12 opportunities per day. When people talk about space tourism, one thing they haven't been bringing up is they have got to relocate to the equator. Unless they're playing a bunch of uh, bed and breakfasts versus a grand hotel. You could have mobile uh, flights to, I'm sorry, you could have mobile space stations to, uh, from a single launch site or you can support a single space station by local launch sites around the world. Okay, this is the first vehicle in the, uh, my launch architecture. The, uh, basically, it's a derivative of the Dumb Booster concept. The reason I like it is that it has a very low development cost, approximately $160 million. The, uh, the situation with building a reusable launch vehicle is that it costs about $5,000 per pound to build a reusable launch vehicle. So at the current planning with 100 flights, uh, you're expending basically $50 of hardware for every flight. With the simplified expendable launch vehicle concept, it costs $50 per pound to build this expendable. So the, uh, this uh, system was essentially uh, test built in the late 60s. The, a rocket engine was constructed by a plumbing contractor. The tanks were constructed by a boiler company. And this was all sponsored as an Air Force project. So it uh, uses pressure-fed uh, engines to eliminate the uh, turbo pumps, use the blade of uh, nozzle, uh, internal nozzle to eliminate regenerative cooling. So the whole system was based on reducing the cost of your issue with these uh, simplified spinal launch vehicle is would it be reliable enough for your personnel and uh, high value satellites? The assumption is it's not. So how do you get your uh, satellites to the, the space station? How do you get your personnel to the space station? My solution is a single stage orbit launch vehicle. Now building a single stage orbit launch vehicle is extremely difficult because there's a relationship between the energy content of the fuel and the energy that must be expended to reach orbit. As a result, a hydrogen oxygen propelled single stage orbit launch vehicle can only put 10% of its gross liftoff weight flow into Earth orbit. 1% of that is considered to be the payload. The rest is the launch hardware, the engines, the tanks. Building a very small system um, is extremely difficult because some parts of those systems simply do not uh, scale. My solution here for the SSTO is I was looking at the idea of servicing an orbital transfer vehicle on orbit to carry satellites into higher orbit. I realized I could service the SSTO. So what I have is a 100,000 pound vehicle on the ground. It flies into orbit, now weighs 10,000 pounds. It's 
It's carrying personnel. There's an exchange of personnel. 2,000 pounds is now added to the SSTO. 1,000 pounds of fluids for a transpiration heat shield, 1,000 pounds of rocket propellant for the propulsive landing system. I now have a 12,000 pound vehicle on orbit. It deorbits, comes down, and uh, it is now a 10,000 pound vehicle on the ground. So in this way, I now have a, a reliable single stage orbit launch vehicle. However, it is more expensive to operate than the expendable in this case. Now all of this has to take place at space station, and this is going to be crucial, is that we have to build our space station very quickly. They have to be a man in the can, we supply it there. You cannot spend billions of dollars on a space station to have any sort of commercial operation. Now this system is what I call box kite affair. Basically, using tethers, the bottom of, a tether, of the uh, tether is operating at suborbital velocity. The top of the tether is at, operating at above orbital velocity. The center of the tether is what is actually in orbit. As a result, with a uh, separation of 50 kilometers, you have essentially a 1% gravity gradient at the bottom and at the top. Now you need that 1% of gravity to settle your propellant. You cannot have uh, gases in your propellant. So, uh, okay. we'll go to the next slide. Now, the uh, simplified expendable launch vehicle, the SSTO, and space station can basically meet three out of the four uh, commercial interests. But to get us into space tourism, we have to go far, far lower. A yes, the single stage orbit launch vehicle cannot break through a hundred dollar mark. The, the cost of propeller alone is twenty five dollars per pound of uh, payload. So ultimately, we have to go into something that's beyond rocketry, which is where we come into the tether. Now, the tether is ideal for the space tourism market because it has to be kept in balance. As the uh, SSTO goes up to the tether, grabs hold of it, it pulls it down from the elliptical orbit. When it releases, the tether returns back to the elliptical orbit. So to retain it in a roughly a circular orbit, you always have a SSTO attached. So in between, the tether is rising and falling is essentially a kinetic energy storage system. Now, the advantage here with a 1,751 kilometer tether is that at that altitude, it would be This is a variation on uh, the tether. It's an air scoop. The intention is we have a scoop that drops into the lower atmosphere. It collects atmospheric gases. Those gases are then brought up to the center of the uh, tether, where they are exhausted using electric propulsion. Now, the reason for this is that a tether system is essentially has to be kept in a mass balance. So while it's ideal for space tourism, where you have people going up and people coming back, if you want to put something permanently in space, then you need to compensate for that by using electric power. So what this chart basically illustrates is you need about 2 megawatts of power to move about 157 tons a year into a permanent orbit. Well now this was essentially the architecture for her, uh, how we would get uh, equipment into space, how we get people in space, but the whole center of this was building the space elements. So what are the advantages of real settlements? And when we're talking settlements, we're talking essentially going back to the 1975 studies where you have 10,000 per person habitat. Now the main advantage with the LEO settlements is the Earth's magnetic field. Because as the uh, original Lagrange habitats, the passive radiation shield was approximately 10 times more massive than the uh, weight of the habitat itself. So by breaking 
the uh, space shuttle is bound to lower its orbit, you're reducing the amount of mass that you require for the settlement by 80%. Now, another advantage is that one of the major cost elements of the settlement was the cost of hauling nitrogen off of the Earth and bringing it to the range settlements. Because uh, nitrogen was critical as to for the atmosphere, and it, there's a large volume of atmosphere in the space settlements. So in this, you still have to haul the nitrogen up off the Earth, but now you don't have to carry it all the way to the range point. So that further reduces the cost of the settlement. And the uh, third advantage is simply, okay, here you have a gateway between the Earth and space. So the, the LEO settlements will likely be like a port of call for the industry that travels back and forth. Now there are also significant disadvantages though. Could be operating in a two hour orbit. So you have only 90 minutes of sunlight followed by a 30 minute period of darkness. So the uh, Leo sat settlements are, probably, are going to be artificial. But you cannot really use artificial lighting for agriculture. It's too expensive. So the agriculture will have to be based on that 90 minute, 30 minute uh, cycle. And uh, I don't think anybody's ever done any work along that line. Presumably, it can be done. The plant as won't die in that 30 minute period, but it's something that does have to be explored. Let's see. And uh, also, too, if you're working in that, uh, with that 30 minute darkness, sunlight is the driver for it, uh, industry. You, you would be melting metal with sunlight. So you can't really do that in that just having a 90 minute period. You know, the range points you have continuous sunlight. So you could focus, your, you could focus in, operate a smelter for several hours at a time. Uh, Leo settlements, it's going to be uh, a less energetic industry. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, revisiting the 1975 uh, uh, settlement studies. Uh, one, they were had estimated that it was $190 billion in 1975 dollars. So, question here, what has changed? With the use of tethers, we should be able to reduce costs to about one-tenth as much as what the original settlement expected. Uh, they also assumed that there would be use of nuclear power on the moon for a continuous power source. If this is done, it's going to be done commercially. And chances are that uh, placing nuclear power on the moon is going to be too controversial. And nuclear power will be a political matter because there are specific laws that have uh, the President of the United States saying he has to authorize the placement of any nuclear material in space. Uh, other issues, payback uh, began the 15th year, positive cash flow until the 28th year. So that's not going to work. It has to be incrementally funded commercially. Uh, the economy was based on uh, solar power satellites. The assumption here that uh, we're looking at other sources of income, relatively much lower. And uh, the big thing was the hardware was shipped from the Earth to the Moon. That isn't going to happen. It's too expensive. Basically, they were, uh, had planned to ship the power plants, the mass driver, build it on the Earth, out, uh, then assemble on the Moon. We have to bootstrap on um, the, the Moon. We have to learn to construct our own power plants from the in-situ materials. We have to learn to construct the mass driver from in-situ materials. Okay, and there was a heavy research and development cost to reduce uh, the space transportation. We need to basically shrink down the launch vehicles. Otherwise, uh, the costs are just going to be too large for any commercial project to handle. The uh, figure I gave uh, for the SSTO, that was a thousand pound payload capable vehicle. The estimate I had was one to three million dollars for development. Now, vehicles themselves would run 75 million for a first unit, 50 million for a fleet uh, unit price, but those rules apply to any other vehicle. So if you build a project vehicle 
that's 40,000 pounds to be able to keep, or you're looking at a 40 to 120 billion dollar development effort. And one thing too, they, while uh, they, the study didn't uh, know about water on the moon, they did anticipate the use of the lunar oxygen. So, settlements must be self-sufficient. Now, what you have is the, the difference between hard currency and soft currency. You, hard currency essentially exports to uh, uh, essentially another location, bringing up imports. So, they, you have to have a form of hard currency in the import and export, but the bulk of your economy has got to be soft. It's basically the trading of services. And uh, that uh, concludes it. Uh, are there any questions? <laughs>